So in this video we're going to talk about the famous Gaussian integral and how to evaluate this. So as the name implies this was discovered by Gauss so of course it's absolutely beautiful. So we'll start with what the Gaussian function is. So the Gaussian function is the function f of x is equal to e to the negative x squared, so exponential of minus x squared. And this is an important function because it's basically the normal distribution. Uh, or, you know, it's not standardised. It needs a constant out the front, and then it will be one of the normal distributions. Of course, there are loads of different normal distributions. You can change the mu and the sigma parameter. Uh, in fact, I'll just write out. So, um, if you want the PDF of a normal random variable, so let's say we have x is normally distributed with mean mu and variance, or variance rather, sigma squared, then the PDF of this, the probability density function, would be 1 over the square root of 2 pi sigma e to the negative, and then it's, oops, missed something, minus a half x minus mu over sigma all squared. So you can see uh, that this thing is a special case of this. So if I set mu firstly to zero, then I'll just have x squared over 2 sigma squared. If I then make sigma squared equal to a half, uh, then that half on the bottom here will cancel with this 2 on the bottom here, so that I'll just get minus x squared. And then I'll get this constant out the front. So I made sigma squared equal to a half, remember, so that would mean that sigma was equal to 1 over the square root of 2. So we then have 1 over the square root of 2 here, which would cancel with this square root of 2 here, so we'd end up just with 1 over the square root of pi. So 1 over the square root of pi times e to the negative x squared, it's an example of a normal distribution. It's not the standard normal distribution. The standard normal distribution, remember, you set mu equal to 0, but you don't set sigma squared equal to a half as we did here. You set sigma squared equal to 1. Uh, so the standard normal distribution would then be uh, 1 over the square root of 2 pi e to the negative a half x squared, so not e to the negative x squared, e to the negative a half x squared. So slightly different, but this function that is called the Gaussian function, it is clearly very related to this. So you can therefore, if you know anything about the normal distribution, you'll be able to draw roughly what this graph looks like. So it looks like a bell-shaped curve, kind of like this. So the goal then for this video is to evaluate the Gaussian integral. So as I say, this function is called the Gaussian function. And then the Gaussian integral is the integral from negative infinity to infinity of e to the negative x squared dx. Now, from what I've already told you, you can already work out what this integral is going to come out as. You might already know the answer because it is a very famous integral, but remember I told you that the normal distribution that would have e to the negative x squared in needs mu to be zero and sigma squared to equal half, and we saw that then we end up with one over the square root of pi times e to the negative x squared as the PDF of that normal distribution, and PDFs always have to integrate to 1, so the integral of e to the negative x squared over the square root of pi, it must integrate to 1, and therefore the integral of just e to the negative x squared must be the square root of pi. So the answer to this is going to come out as the square root of pi. So we have the answer already, uh, but now we want to actually uh, derive that. So this is really, really clever, because if you initially try and look at this and do it with the standard method that you would attempt to integrate things in calculus, you would try and find a antiderivative to this function so that you can apply the fundamental theorem of calculus and then just take the limit uh, as your upper and lower limits go to infinity and negative infinity of the antiderivative minus the antiderivative evaluated at the lower limit. Um, you get problems with that. I mean, try and find an antiderivative to this function. 
try and find a closed form expression for the antiderivative of that function. Uh, have a go, see, see if you get anywhere. Um, I am told that no such closed form expression exists for the antiderivative of e to the negative x squared. I don't know how you prove that. I presume that someone has managed to prove that. God only knows how, but it's something that I am told um, by numerous different people in my life, I've been told this, that there is no closed form expression for e to the negative x squared, where by closed form expression, what I mean is something you can build out of addition, multiplication, uh, powers, you know, taking x to some power, so all the polynomial expressions plus then add in the elementary transcendental functions, so the standard functions of calculus, so e, sine, cos, uh, logarithm, sinh, cosh, these are what we call the elementary transcendental functions, so add those in and you've got addition, multiplication, polynomials, do everything you can with all of that, every single expression you could build out of all of those, they are called the closed form expressions in calculus. And there is no such thing that will differentiate to give e to the negative x squared. That is what I am told. I don't know how you prove that. But that's what you want in order to be able to apply the fundamental theorem of calculus here, but it doesn't exist. So we have to apply a cleverer method, and this was concocted by Gauss. So what we do is we call this integral i, and instead of trying to find i directly, what we do is we instead try to find i squared. And let's just write out what this would be. So it would be the integral from negative infinity to infinity of e to the negative x squared dx. And you might want to now write out exactly the same thing again. We're not going to, though. We're going to write out the same thing again, but with one big change, which is we're going to use a different dummy variable. So instead of writing e to the negative x squared dx here, I'm going to now write e to the negative y squared dy. You can't stop me doing that, you know, it's perfectly valid that I use a different dummy variable here to the one that I'm using here. But here's the clever thing now. Now what I consider can consider is that actually this is the answer to a double integral of a function defined over r2. So if you consider the double integral from negative infinity to infinity of, and then integral from negative infinity to infinity of e to the negative x squared plus y squared dx dy. If you consider doing this integral, and let's just think about what that would mean. So now we haven't just got a one, uh, one independent variable, we've got two independent variables. Our function is a function from r2 to r rather than just being a function from r to r. And now it's kind of like a, a hill kind of. So how am I going to draw this well? It's still like this sort of bell shape, but oh no, this is going horribly wrong. But you can imagine it's, oh, I know what I'll do. I'll sort of draw circles around like that for the sort of level, level curves. Yeah. So it's kind of like that. It's, um, a hill, kind of, where the highest point of the hill is at the center here, zero, zero, and then as you go further away from the, um, the center, it's going down, and it's symmetric radially, so the circles are level curves. Uh, it's kind of like, in fact, it's what you'd get if you took this and then revolved it around this axis here. It's like a um, a surface of revolution, if you will, around this axis. So we want to then integrate under that, so we want to find the volume underneath that surface over the entire of the R2 plane. And now I need to convince you that this is in fact equal to this. So if you wanted to do this integral of this, you'd firstly break this up using the exponential rule into e to the negative x squared times e to the negative y squared. And then your first thing you're integrating with respect to is x, so that e to the negative y squared plays no role in that, so you can pull that out. In fact, I might do this sort of intermediate step. So you then get the integral from negative infinity to infinity of e to the negative y squared, and then we've got the inner integral, which is the integral from negative infinity to infinity of e to the negative x squared, dx, and then dy. 
right? So you do this integral first, and then you do the outer integral. But then this is just some answer. This is whatever i is that we're trying to find out. So this is a constant. So you could then pull this out, and you can see that if we did that, we'd then just get this integral times this integral, which is what is here. So this is indeed equal to this. So our i squared, i being the integral we're trying to find, i squared is equal to this thing. Now, why, why does this help? Because this looks as though it's even worse. You've gone from a one-dimensional integral to a two-dimensional integral, but this is actually better because we can now change coordinates and we're going to integrate not with respect to the Cartesian coordinate system over R2, but with respect to the polar coordinate system over R2. And the brilliance is that this function, because it's radially symmetric, in polar coordinates, it's now just e to the negative r squared, because x squared plus y squared is r squared. So it becomes e to the negative r squared with respect to the polar coordinate system, because it has no dependence on theta. And then we just have to remember the clever thing. Well, actually, firstly, if you didn't do the clever thing, you'd have a problem, because then you're just trying to, again, integrate e to the negative r squared, which we've already said is a very difficult thing to do. Um, but we're saved by the fact that when you transform the area element into polar coordinates, or if rather the area element in polar coordinates is not just dr d theta, which is what you would naively think it was. No, it's r dr d theta. Because remember, um, when you've got Cartesian coordinates, if you make a tiny little change in x, a tiny little change in y, you make a little square, and the area of that is going to be just dx dy. Whereas if you make, if you're in polar coordinates, and let me just draw something for polar coordinates. We'll do it in a different colour. So let's do it like this. So if you make a tiny little change in R, or in fact we'll do it here, if you make a tiny little change in R, you're going out in the radial direction, but then if you make a tiny little change in theta, you go in the theta direction, which is orthogonal to the um, dr direction. And the problem is that depending on your radial distance, the amount that you change for a change in theta changes. The further you go out, that change that you make for d theta is going to be bigger and bigger and bigger. So actually, this tiny little thing you get here is not just dr times d theta, but no, it's dr times r d theta. So for a tiny change in theta, you have to multiply it by the radial distance you are away from the origin because that's how much you're actually going to change for that tiny change in theta. It gets bigger the further you are radially outwards. So it's, dr is fine. dr, how much, uh, you know, the length that you actually change in your plane for a change in that r coordinate is constant no matter what r or what theta position you're actually at. But d theta is not. Um, the actual length you move in the plane for a coordinate change d theta varies depending on what the radial distance away from the origin is. And that's why you need the r dr d theta. So this then becomes r dr d theta here. And that saves us now because r e to the negative r squared is integrable. We can just reverse the chain rule. So let's do this here. So bring this here. So we're going to get Let's change our bounds. We're going to integrate over the entire plane. So we need to integrate theta from 0 to 2 pi, and we need to integrate r from 0 to infinity. So that covers the whole plane in radial coordinates. And then our function is e to the negative r squared, and then we've got r dr d theta. And we're doing integrating with respect to r first, because we've put r 0 to infinity here. So then we just reverse the chain rule here, r e to the negative r squared. If you take e to the negative r squared and differentiate that, you'll get minus 2r e to the negative r squared. So if you instead um, took minus a half e to the negative r squared, then that minus a half will cancel with the minus 2 here, and you'd then get r e to the negative r squared. So I've therefore found an antiderivative for r e to the negative r squared. It's minus a half e to the negative r squared. So I now just need to apply the fundamental theorem of calculus and evaluate this between zero and infinity. So this thing evaluated at infinity then, as you go to infinity here, this is going to go to zero, this bit. So the first bit goes to zero, and then we're going to have minus 
this evaluated at zero. Zero here gives one, e to the zero is one. Uh, so we then get minus minus a half, so we just get a half. So this inner integral here, this is a half. So we've then just got integral a half will pull out from zero to two pi d theta, which of course is just two pi divided by a half then, so two pi divided by a half. So this integrates just two pi because of course it's just theta evaluated between zero and two pi, which is just two pi. Uh, and therefore we get is equal to pi. And if you remember what was this thing we've just come up with, it wasn't I, remember, it was I squared. So I squared, we now know, is equal to pi, and therefore I, our original integral, the Gaussian integral, is the square root of pi, which is what we said it must be uh, from our formulas for the normal distribution. So that is the ingenious method that Gauss discovered for how to evaluate this famous integral the integral of e to the negative x squared from negative infinity to infinity. It is the square root of pi, it's called the Gaussian integral, and it's really, really important in probability theory. Thank you.